video series about the storyteller. Now, if you, you, it doesn't take a whole lot to guess who we're talking about, who the storyteller is, but before we kind of get to him, and what a master story, masterful storyteller that he is, well, let's, let's back up quick and just have a couple basic un- concepts of story. So this is kind of, it's got to be the introductory message. So I want to lay down a couple foundation pieces. What is a story? I, let me give you a couple of like just one-liners. Stories are equipment for living. Stories actually help us engage with life. There's something we learn from stories. Stories help us make sense out of life. Uh, the power of watching a story is that we often see ourselves in it. Stories are data with a soul. Brene Brown is, is famous for saying that. Stories are data with a soul. Stories are metaphors that enlighten us. And stories are superior to life. Story is never exactly life itself. It be, because life itself is full of routine. And one of the things that sets great storytellers apart are the storytellers who know which detail to leave in and which detail to leave out. For instance, perhaps you've, ever, you've heard someone tell you this story. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you a story. I woke up the other day, and my alarm clock went off, and I leaned to my left side, and I reached over, and I shut off my alarm. I leaned back, put both my hands on my bed, I pushed myself up, planted both my feet on the ground, shifted my weight, and stood up and yawned. I then rubbed my eyes, looked around the floor for my slippers, and realized I don't wear slippers. I walked over to the door, I turned, okay, so you see, you get my point, right? Like, shoot me, that's not a story. That's not a story. That's a sequence of details that have no meaning, all right? So th- uh, that's an important thing to understand with stories because great storytellers leave space in a story. You actually leave the space because your imagination fills in the gaps. So th- that's part of good storytelling. And, wh- and Oh, I'm giving it away. Jesus, of course, is the master storyteller, and when we get to his stories, you're gonna see there's all kinds of space left for you to kind of go, oh, imagine, the sp- imagine what the context was like. Give some imagery to it. Fill in some of the details. And by the way, what does that mean? That means that a lot of times stories are interpreted different ways because there's all this space in between to put your own interpretation of some of those other details. Now, a lot of great stories actually hone in on a universal truth or a certain principle, but oftentimes people take different, have different takeaways from different stories. How many times have you seen or read in the Bible or watched a movie or read a book and actually gotten something, been inspired differently each time? So what, what's happening? There's space in a story. Now this is really important when it comes to our faith. If the primary way we were given this understanding of faith was through stories with that kind of ambiguity, then what happened when we, somewhere in the lo- in, in, <clears throat> along the way with the church, where we lined up all these presuppositions and we built mechanisms of fear and control around those presuppositions. And so it's not that we don't adhere to a certain collection of beliefs called doctrine or whatever else, but a lot of us have gotten lost in the knowledge and missed the relationship. This is what happens in mechanisms and fear and control. It becomes all about managing a system rather than being engaged in relationship. So let me give you one more thing. I can't, I don't have time for it to go into it in depth, but I'm gonna give you a little piece on truth. This question came up last week when Kevin and I did the Q&A. But I'm gonna say this about truth and we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more in the weeks to come. Facts are not truth. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say we read a statistic and the fact is 120 people are moving to Nashville every day. Now that, let's just say that's just a st- statistic on a piece of paper, it's, it's a fact. Now someone reads that and goes, oh dear God. The, in, the infrastructure of the city is going to collapse. Nashville is going to lose its charm. Way too many of these people from California keep coming. Uh, they're ruining our lives. They say dude a lot. And um, it's now casual. People wear shorts and flip-flops. I miss the days of ties and suits. I mean, just 120 people a day. Now, what just happened? That, someone goes, oh, that's the fact. Our city's ruined. No, it's not the fact. That's the meaning you applied to a fact, making it your own truth, small t. 
when you combine those truths, you create your own narrative. So if that person hears that statistic and begins to funnel that through that, applies that meaning, continue that story, what happens in the narrative, their reticulator activating device is suddenly on. That, that's the thing like, uh, if you're ever like, I should buy a Honda, I wonder if Honda's a good car, and then you drive around and you're like, Hondas are everywhere. <laughs> like, when you think of something and then suddenly you see it all the time in something, that's, that's actually a mechanism in the brain called the reticulator activating device. It's very interesting. Um, and b by the way, like if you see a person, you're like, that person is uh, not trustworthy. And then you, everything they do that's not trustworthy, you, or that uh, everything they do that kind of is off from your mind, oh, that's not trustworthy, they're not trustworthy. Not. You see how it just keeps reinforcing it? That's a thing in your brain, right? So what happens is you go, 120 people today is bad for Nashville. You create meaning and watch the narrative. Ah, oh, it's downtown Nashville. I thought this California was bad. I met a New Yorker. He's so rude. See, the charm is gone from our city. I knew it was going to happen. 220 people are moving here today. And you know what? I was on the road and I was backed up for miles. Told you. Infrastructure, this stinks. Why do people keep moving in here? Didn't you move here three years ago? Yeah, but I'm here now. Nobody else should move here. <laughs> you, meaning. Same fact. 120 people moving here today from Nashville. Same fact. Somebody else goes, I think it's wonderful. I just love it. It's good for the economy. I hope Amazon comes with the 50,000 people. <laughs> My shipment might come faster. <laughs> and I love those Californians. Every time I go over the house, they give me brownies. That's great. I'm way more chill than I've ever been. I don't know why I'm so chill, but I love those people, and it's fantastic. <laughs> now, this is a fact, but they have a whole new meaning. They love 120 people coming to Nashville. And they, and they follow that narrative. Everything, oh, you're new to Nashville? Oh, that's great. It's so good. There's less white people. I'm so glad you're here. Like, a whole different narrative. This is an important thing about truth because sometimes what we claim is truth is not truth. It's a meaning we applied to a fact. I don't have time to go into that in, de in depth, but that's really important, okay? Um... Another fascinating thing about truth, you don't learn much from truths that are easy to swallow. So if you want to learn and you want to grow, you, you, and you watch the same television news network every day, you, that's just kind of reinforcing your position. You just need to know that. That's not an easy truth. You're just, it's just reinforcing a position. If you really want to grow, go read multiple different perspectives. And be ready for the fact that there might be some truth that you right now don't think is true because you applied meaning. If you want to grow, look at various perspectives. All right, now why story? Why is story so important to us? The best way to unite an idea with an emotion is by telling a compelling story. So if you have an idea, in our case, we have uh, what we would call it more than an idea, but for, to a typical passerby, we go, well, I have this idea. I, I think that my interpretation of scripture, of the Bible, my interpretation is that this is a redemptive story. It's actually a love story. Now, someone else may go, I read the Bible and I see it as a condemnation story. They've interpreted it different. So you go, well, these are two competing ideas, condemnation story, love story. And I go, well, here's my idea, and I want to connect it to emotion. There's this man named Jesus. He went to the cross out of love for you and for me to create connection with the divine God. That great sacrifice created opportunity for us to be deeply known. This was sacrifice. We all know intuitively that anything of value costs something. God's son gave up the ultimate so that we could be in love with him. This is my story. Someone else may go, uh, tell the same version, but tell it with a condemnation bent. So just, just keep that in mind. One of the, we need stories because they help us make sense out of life. It takes the superficiality of life and explores its depth. All right, that's great storytelling. Storytelling changes lives. Literally. Kurt Thompson in The Anatomy of the Soul says this. When a person tells her story and is truly heard and understood. In other words, there's an empathetic listener. Both she and the listener undergo actual changes in their brain circuitry. So when you share something with someone and they're empathetic, they're like holding the space for you, they, they're looking in you in the eye, there, there is a change in circuitry. 
physiologically, you are changing your mind. By the way, this is why it's so powerful to sit with your child or to sit with a spouse, to look them in the eye, to empathetically listen. Because guess what? There's changes happening physiologically in your brain and there's a connection happening between the two. That's why from the early days of Journey, we say, hey, share it, tell us your story. I wanna hear your story because if you share some of your story, we're gonna have a point of connection and I'm gonna be a better human being because this thing keeps evolving and changing. And so are you. So Jesus is the master storyteller. And throughout his teaching and throughout his life, he's constantly spinning yarns. Now, some of these stories we call parables. And he uses these parables to tease the mind. He's challenging the audience to think critically rather than mindlessly being obedient to a moralism constructed out of fear and control. So, again, for context... Jesus came in a day where you have this imperialistic system, the Roman government, and then you have this law-driven system, Judaism at the time, and everything was driven for moralism. Moralism being defined as your, the goal of your life is to follow these rules. Love was, not, was way, way, way in the background. The goal is to follow these rules, because if you follow these rules, maybe you can earn love. Jesus comes in to sub- subvert this system because both systems, the imperial Roman system and the Judaistic, Judaistic system, were both systems of fear and control. He comes in to subvert the system and go, stop judging one another, and actually I need you to recognize that this is first and foremost about a relationship with the divine, about being connected in love, awakening to who you really are. So let me leave you this quote, and then we'll jump into our story. Knowledge of God is not a set of agreed-upon presuppositions distilled to rules for living. That was the way of the Pharisees. But rather, awakening to the present love exchange with the divine. And if, if you grew up with a religious background, like, like I did, you're still kind of unraveling some of this. Because there was such a pressure to get our knowledge. Now, knowledge is important, knowledge is significant, but, but if it's just knowledge that stays here, knowledge puffs up and becomes all about being right and then leveraging that rightness and fear and control to get other people to help make you emotionally safe. (laughs) That's the story of churches through the ages. We're, as a church, continually attempting to subvert what we know is a natural default mechanism to move to fear and control, but to subvert it and keep going, no, there's great ambiguity. No, there's a lot of freedom. We trust God in you. We need to be in relationship with one another because if we're in a relationship with another, we can see what's going on. We can have some greater perception. We need to be engaged in the word. So, again, this is our attempt to go, let's follow the teachings of Jesus. Well, let's kick it off with uh, one of his stories. It's found in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, opening line, at that time, the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Some people believe, well, the kingdom of heaven is this far-off distant land. It's a post-earth experience. We believe Jesus' teaching, they're saying, no, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is in you. So the kingdom of heaven being defined as an alternate reality. A basically different dimensional way to live. Living into the rhythms of the kingdom would be living according to God's plan with his spirit, active working through us, so that we are at, like the divine is transforming us and we're seeing through a totally different lens. I often use the example of picture like Narnia. Like the kingdom of heaven is like, wow, there's this other world all around us, we just don't see it. Why like Jesus says all the time, if he who has eyes to see and ears to hear. So when you hear this story, I don't hear this story like this is like a setup and then there's a rapture or Jesus is coming back and there's a post-earth heaven thing. That's not how I hear the story. Some theologians would say that's the case. And maybe it's that too. But this opening line for me sets it up that this is a present reality. This is a story about ongoing moments. That's how I hear it, all right? At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish, one took, uh, foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come and meet him! 
And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps, which means they basically lit them, and then turned up the fire so they could see. The foolish ones said to the wise, uh, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us, or for both, both us and you, so instead go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And you get one little punch right at the end. Sometimes Jesus explains, sometimes he just leaves the story as it is. In this case, he gives you kind of a one-line thought. Therefore, pay attention. Stay awake. Keep watch. Because you do not know the day or the hour. I would interpret that because every moment is an opportune moment. Now this is a perfect example of how Jesus had come had not come to simply reinforce moral behaviors. Everything about this parable at first even seems a little backwards. The wise virgins with the extra oil are unwilling to share. Like, if you read this as a moralism tale, isn't this like against all the thing you tell your kids? Like, hey, I'm running out of oil, can I have some? And we go, yes, share with your neighbor. He, she needs some oil. And they go, nope, can't have any of mine, because I might run out. So dang selfish. Like, if it's a moralism tale, you go, well, th- th- this doesn't seem kind. Is the, that's not nice. Um, and then the foolish virgins who, fi- fi- virgins who finally get the, to the wedding banquet, they're not allowed in. Well, doesn't that seem a little exclusive? I mean, it's not their fault. I mean, that seems a little harsh. I mean, dad, insult to injury. Then, they're, then they're the, the, the bridegroom's the door and says, I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> This is not a nice parable. This is where Jesus is going. He's taking my, what might seem like a moralism tale and he's turning it on his head. He's going, actually, I want you to pay attention. Now, in those days, and if, if we were, uh, we lived in this context, some of the nuances of this story might pop to us a little bit more. So I'm gonna give you that because it'll help you relate to the story. In those days, a uh, wedding wasn't like we do a wedding today. Everybody like, everything's stressed and crazy till like the moment of 30 minute ceremony and then go party. Their thing was, this could be like days, a week-long event. So a huge event. And, and there's processionals here and processionals there, and there's traditions and all of these things. And so a lot of times the bridesmaids, they would be prepared. They're, they want to be a part of the celebration. They've been invited to be a part of the celebration. They're a big part of the celebration. But they've got to be prepared. And so they're waiting. There's a moment where the bridegroom comes late. But this, for whatever happened this night, he's coming late. Maybe he was hanging out with the Californians. But whatever reason, he comes late and he, he shows up and, and when he finally shows up, some of them are ready and some of them are not. And the ones who are ready get to go off and be a part of the celebration. They get to enjoy the moment. They are present to the reality of the bridegroom. The ones who are not prepared miss the moment. Now, notice a couple of the themes in the story. Stories have themes. And by the way, as we go, I'm going to give you some elements of story making. So, for instance, in every film you watch, probably within the first five to 15 minutes, there's an inciting incident. There's something that happens that sets the trajectory for the rest of the film. Uh, Most films are told, or stories are told in three acts. There's often an epilogue. So along the way, I'm going to give you kind of story elements. Now you go, don't ruin watching movies for me. No, it's not going to hopefully ruin it. Maybe, if anything, it might even accentuate it, but I'm going to just give you some elements to to story forming. but there, most stories have themes. There's something happening in the story that's carrying you through. Uh, do you catch any of the themes here? What do you see? First of all, there's this vessel thing, right? These lamps keep, these vessels are mentioned. What's another, where else do you hear the term vessel in scripture, like earthen vessel? Right? So you see some metaphor showing up pretty quickly here. This lamp is a lot like us, and the vessel is a container of oil, and then the vessel creates light. How does the vessel, how is the light shown from the vessel? By the oil. The oil in scripture over and over again, when you hear, when you hear about healing, when you hear about other things in scripture, oil is, uh, oil is also provision. Do you know what oil typically relates to? The Holy Spirit. 
So you already have these kind of subtle things popping in the story. That when we're aware of the active presence of God in us and we're tuned into that, the light is shining. When we're not aware of that and we're closed off, we're just an earthen vessel, we're not shining forth the light of his love, we're not tuned into his presence, we're not aware. So we are awakened to God's presence when we remain in contact with the dispenser of the oil. So what happened to the five foolish virgins? They're running off to go, oh, I sh- I, yeah, I, did. I gotta run off to go get some more oil, which is a little bit of a picture of, I haven't remained connected to God. I'm, I, I'm not aware of where I am in relationship with him. I've got to go figure that out. And in that, there's, there's a lostness in the moment while these others are, quote, being found. They're stepping into the celebration. There's an awareness of his spirit. I gave you this, this illustration a month or two ago about, it was a thing from uh, Elizabeth Gilbert on creativity, but opportunity works in the same analogy. Opportunity, creativity, um, it comes. It's announced, it hovers, and then opportunity, creativity, it goes. So the question is whether or not we're tuned into it, whether or not we're ready to engage it when it comes. How many times have you looked back and go, ah, that was a missed opportunity? How many of you had a creative idea and then like a year later, someone else is doing that same idea and you're usually mad about it? I had the same idea. Yeah, but you didn't, it came to you and didn't act on it. This is part of the premise of this story is moment by moment, the bridegroom cometh. Jesus loves you. Love is swirling about you at every moment. There is an opportunity to join him in the creative process. There is an opportunity to celebrate what he's doing in the world. There's an opportunity to apply meaning to this fact that this is a redemptive story full of celebration and it will produce gratitude. Or, if you don't spend time with a dispenser of oil, if you don't spend time with God, allowing you to have an awareness of his spirit, then you will be closed. You will be distant, distracted, shut out, not known. It's all wedged right here in this space. And perhaps maybe the most powerful statement in this whole thing is this. We cannot borrow the oil of our neighbor's transformation. Hey, can I have some of yours? No. Actually, you can't. Because you can't. And some of us want to live vicariously through someone else. We want our spouse to do the work. We want our, a pastor to do our work, a village leader to do our work, a teacher, a friend, a mentor, a parent. I'll just live through your transformation. No. You're responsible for you. Each of us is responsible for our own journey. And we best not grow weary or fall asleep or we miss out on the banquet. And it's not a, yes, there's a future banquet to it, but it's a present banquet. It's a banquet of goodness that we've been invited to if we would have eyes to see and ears to hear. What happens when we're not aware? This is where we're here. We're lost in sin. What's a pre- I've given you, a through the, I, and I'm gonna keep doing this because if you grew up in church, sin tends to have a lot of baggage to it. Let's get a, I'm gonna give you another definition of sin. I've given you probably five of these, but here's another one. Here's a pretty good working definition for sin. Whatever breaks the flow of love. So if you're not aware, you're not awakened, and you're frustrated, you're angry, you're lost, you're bitter, you're, you're, you're distracted, it's just, it's just what happened? You're not fulfilling your potential, sin is missing the mark, and you've broken the flow of love. Does that mean you're not loved? No, you're still loved, but the, it's not flowing through you. It's not flowing out of you, in you and out of you, because you're just not aware of it. So you're not tuned to it. The flame is not ignited. You, you can't see. You know what the Bible says about uh, <clears throat> the word? The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It doesn't say it is a spotlight for four miles down the road, <laughs> which is frustrating for many of us. It's like, dear God, I need to know what I need to do there. And he's going, yep, you got about three feet. <laughs> 
Word of God is a lamp under my feet. It's all you get. Go ahead and take the next couple steps. What do I do after that? Keep it lit. <laughs> Remember that line from I quoted Tim last week? Sometimes are praying, some of us are praying prayers just to figure out how to live without God. But give me a searchlight down the path so I don't have to spend so much time with you. I'm mean, having to pray for you every day this week because I'm so worried. I mean, that's how it often plays out in our lives. He's going, no, I know you. And I know the culture you live in. And uh, this culture needs good stories. Our culture needs important stories. Some of you need to go craft some beautiful stories to help jar our country to help jar the Western mind. Because we live currently in a time of affluence and abundance. Some of you were forced to read this in school, but Aldous Huxley wrote about this when he, and he said he feared that we would become a trivial culture that would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Did you have some moments this week drowning in a sea of irrelevance? What did you do with that hour? What if you got that hour back? How do they have the money to go to the Caribbean? Oh, she's cute. Oh, what an awful haircut. Come here, you gotta see this haircut. What are they thinking? It's a brave new world. In 1931, he wrote that Westerners would be given so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Narcissism. What he meant by that was we would be curating the perception of our lives. He wrote that in 1931, that this was the trajectory of Western civilization. And he said eventually what would happen is We'd let others know where we are at all times and we'd let them tell us what to believe and what to value. In the 1980s, Neil Postman wrote a book reflecting on this and he said this, what will happen eventually is we will be left amusing ourselves to death. The bridegroom cometh. But do we have any oil? How much have you been counting on the transformation of another to buoy you, carry you, believe in truth for you? And you understand, that what I'm not saying is it's time for you to go to get a degree in theology. What I'm saying is, how are you being intentional and in practicing in an apprenticeship of Jesus, in the Jesus way? How do you have eyes to see and ears to hear what's happening in the kingdom? Are you participating in the celebration? Are you in the party? Every morning you wake up, there's an invitation to a party, just so you know. Every morning you wake up, Maybe some of you, would be good for you, draw this on a card, put it on your mirror, put it on the desk, and draw it like a wedding invitation. And go, here's the invitation. I'm invited to this wedding. I'm invited to this party right now. I can be in it right now when I wake up. What's the, what's the party? It's a party about you. Because you're deeply loved. And not just you, but the other people in your home, and the other people next to your home, and the other people around the world, because God created us in love, by love, for love. I'm gonna ask you one of those hard questions. Are you dying slowly for something you're not really willing to die for? What could you have done with that hour? Those two hours? If you had them back. Because your earthen vessel is dying. In the brief time on the planet, what if you got it back? 
How could you be in love? How could you tend to the lamp? Be aware of the oil. Let that light so shine before man that they would see your generous Father and be drawn to the light. It seems appropriate that this morning we just finish this time with a story. It's a to- story of two people, ultimately whose daughter initiated them finding their way to the light. This is a story of Terry and Susie. First, you need to know I came to Journey as an atheist at worst, an agnostic at best. So Gretchen found some friends. She found Journey uh, and asked us if we'd give it a try because it was really different. And I said to Gretchen, no thank you. I like where we are, which is nowhere. Finally, she came and the Sunday before Father's Day, she goes, Dad, will you come to Journey? If not for you, will you come to Journey for me? It was immediately different, but uh, I put on my resistor suit and sat down and about four rows from Jamie and sat there with my arms folded and my legs folded and said, okay, he's talking, but I'm not gonna listen. So at the end of the service, remember this? As I poked Jamie in the chest, they say I said, I didn't agree with what you said, but we'll be back or something like that. But I'm too nice to say things like that. So anyway, long story short, (laughs) we came back the following Sunday and the following Sunday and the following Sunday and the following Sunday for over a year. And Jamie kept using the word surrender every Sunday. And it was like, no, no, that ain't gonna happen. (laughs) Surrender, no, I'm an engineer by education and it's gotta be in an equation and if it doesn't, ain't gonna work. Two years Jamie worked on me (laughs) and at Christmas time of 2010 I looked in the mirror and I said what are you waiting for? Just surrender. Boy has things changed since then. 2012 we got baptized. Yeah Jamie almost had a heart attack when we asked to get baptized. (laughs) It was great. (laughs) And while he was being Mr. Concrete Man up until that point, I was like, this is like an honest place. It was an, an, it felt comfortable. You weren't pressured to give money. You weren't pressured to, um, you weren't pressured for anything. It was home. Yep, definitely it is home. And it still is. I don't know what we would have done without it.